So I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes on some core ideas around what makes us a primate, um, special, different, uh, compromised, excited in the digital world with, in which we live. Now, you might think from all the hullabaloo that AI is a brand new subject. Uh, sadly not. Uh, if you can say, there is a very youthful me there. It looked like some kind of rather bad uh, uh, album cover. This is 1978. <laughs> 1978, and uh, this the Department of Artificial Intelligence, University of Edinburgh. We were busy doing AI. There were PhDs in it. There were departments of it. Despite the best efforts of the UK government to close it down, uh, there had been a thing called the Lighthill Report, Sir James Lighthill, Lucasian Professor of Mathematics in Cambridge, no less, thought that AI and robotics were a load of rubbish and, uh, and, and the UK should disinvest. Um, we kind of saw that AI winter through and, and through a number of cycles of investment, disenchantment, investment, disenchantment, we've had about four or five different enthusiasms for AI, usually centered around a moment when something remarkable happens, uh, usually to human specialist ability. Um, and I'll try and explain why this has been going on, where we are at the moment, would that be different, etc. So the... Um, the um, the book, um, the version here, this has just come out in the States with a rather fetching cover, um, but the book's been out for about a year. Um, there are copies here if you're so interested. You'll notice from the title that it owes a little bit to this wonderful book, okay, which is um, Desmond's, uh, Desmond Morris's uh, wonderful book, um, 50 years ago published, a real bestseller, I have to say, <laughs> um, in which he took time to explain we're primates. We are full of primate urges. We are evolved as primates. We better understand our fundamental human nature in terms of zoology and um, uh, various uh, anthropological studies as well. Um, and you know, despite Darwin being mainstream for the best part of a century, this was still kind of a, a moment when people went, "We really are." You know, uh, the uh, the best chapter in the book is often described as the one on sex. Uh, it still reads rather well, but it, what it actually uh, what you absolutely do get from the book is this sense of just how much of our fundamental nature we owe to our animal origins. And just to uh, expand on that, the first part of our book, which is an homage to Desmond Morris in some respects, begins a long way back. It begins actually with a primate forebear. Um, this is Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, they were roaming around on the African savanna, well, further north than that, probably, three and a half million years ago. And they were also, remarkably, making tools. Okay. Now, this is all very recent. It's pushed back the history of tool making amongst our hominid forebears by a million years at least. Uh, and this was rel relatively advanced, uh, although primitive toolmaking, it is dated reliably to 3.3 million years ago. That means, I ask you to think about this, that for 200,000 generations, more or less, before we even arrive on the scene, Homo sapiens arrive, we're busy making tools. And all the evidence is, is that tool making shaped our neurology, our fine motor precision, possibly was a driving function on our language, on our planning. And we were certainly getting very good at it by the time Homo sapiens arrived. Um, and uh, a member of our family 200, 100,000 years ago was able to perfect and then develop a range of Stone Age implementation that was really quite extraordinary. But for 200,000 generations before that, our technology was in the hands, literally, of our predecessors. And there's a really interesting point to bear in mind here. Our we didn't just make our technology. Our technology made us. Okay. And it's always been the case. And the question we're asking ourselves now is what is the hand axe of the 21st century or the super computer in your pocket or the smartphone doing? Um, there is one fundamental difference, of course, which is that we have very little appreciation of the device we carry around in our pockets. We certainly couldn't make one. Not even Tim Berners-Lee or the best engineer on the planet could make one from start to finish, let alone write the applications that run on it. But it is 
one of the universal tools of our culture and our age. As we kind of do this uh, breakthrough, this fly through to a um, chip on an iPhone, uh, we're down at the feature scale. This is 15 nanometers. These are the gates inside the iPhone. Actually, the um, Apple um, A8 processor, this is a few years out of date, interestingly. But even so, 15 nanometers, you could get 460 of these features, 460 of these gates inside a single red blood cell. Okay. Now, it's very hard for us to appreciate these orders of magnitude. One of the reasons why we get a bit blown away by what happens is that when things double, and this is the famous Moore's law, where you've got number of transistors on a chip as against the year of introduction, these things change so fast we are taken by surprise when we look at the computing power that's on offer and what we can do with that. Uh, I should say, by the way, the video you saw earlier already exactly 50% out of date. Okay, The chip that many of you may be running, the A12 Bionic, has nearly 7 billion transistors on it. The feature size is around about 7 to 8 nanometers. Okay. Now, people will tell you this is all going to run out. There's all sorts of interesting reasons why in physics we might hit the buffers. But actually, I think our ingenuity in the way we build these architectures is, is really extraordinary. We will carry on. Periodically, things change. This wonderful picture is of Kasparov holding his head in his hands the previous AI apocalypse before this one was widely touted in 1997. 20 years or so ago, the machines were going to take our jobs, they're going to wake up, they're going to take care of all the jobs we did because, well, a human was beaten at a very, very difficult game that we kind of prized as a feature, as an aspect of our human intelligence, chess. And it was a difficult challenge, uh, not least because uh, your average game of chess has a search space, which in about the mid-game, halfway through a game of chess, if I've got four plays open to me and my opponent has, there are about 650 billion possible moves just in that piece of what we call the game tree. That's a lot to compute with, OK? But the supercomputer of the time IBM's Deep Blue was searching between 100 and 200 million positions a second. Two things. That's a lot of power, or was then, and it upturned a lot of views about what was and wasn't possible. No human being searches 100 to 200 million positions a second. The system that beat Kasparov, that had him holding his head in his hands, didn't play chess in any way that is remotely human. Okay. But of course, actually, at certain points, Kasparov thought it might. He thought it might be reading his mind, didn't know what was going on. He was literally unnerved by the system. Kasparov writes very well about this experience and is a very thoughtful commentator on where modern AI is. There's another world-class champion holding his head in his hands. This is Lee Sodol, the world's best Go player. That was thought to be well beyond the power of any computer to solve because, well, there are a lot of positions in the big game of a game of Go. In fact, every position, every move in a game of Go probably has 250-odd possible next moves. The search space is insane. But nevertheless, the computers of the day, which we'll talk about a little bit, were capable of searching that space. And with the way we program them now, doing more than that, finding the patterns, beating the world's best Go player. Does that mean we are redundant? Well, we'll come back to that. I think not. But it does mean we live in a world of extraordinary AI embedded everywhere. And by AI, I don't mean the self-aware, reflective computer of Terminator or HAL. Well, not so reflective in Terminator's case, but certainly in HAL's case. This is about systems that can recognize your voice or answer a question about general knowledge by using all the data on, um, on, on the web or driving a car or performing robotic surgery. And we can look at that and get a bit unnerved ourselves. We shouldn't. Okay? We shouldn't just yet. And where it does become alarming, we should exert some moral agency over this whole process and ask ourselves, what do we actually want to happen with this technology? To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. 
or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.